Latter-day Pamphlets. Number 8. Jesuitism. Thomas Carlyle. August 1, 1850. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. As in the history of human things, which needs above all to abridge itself, it happens usually that the chief actors in great events and great epics give their name to the series, and are loosely reputed the causers and authors of them, as a German Reformation is called of Luther, and a French reign of terror passes for the work of Robespierre, and from the Aeneid and earlier this has been the want, so it may be said these current, and now happily moribund, times of ours are worthy to be called in loose language, the age of Jesuitism, an epic whose palinurus is the wretched mortal known among men as Ignatius Loyola. For some two centuries the genius of mankind has been dominated by the gospel of Ignatius, perhaps the strangest and certainly among the fatalist ever preached hitherto under the sun. Some acquaintance, out of Bartoli and others, I have made with that individual, and from old years have studied the workings of him, and to me he seems historically definable, he more than another, as the poison fountain from which these rivers of bitterness that now submerge the world have flowed. Counting from the ever-blessed restoration, or the advent of that singular new defender of the faith called Charles II, it is about two hundred years since we ourselves commenced that bad course, and deeply detesting the name of St. Ignatius, did nevertheless gradually adopt his gospel as the real revelation of God's will, and the solid rule of living in this world, rule long since grown perfectly accredited, complete in all its parts, and reigning supreme among us in all spiritual and social matters whatsoever. The singular gospel, or revelation of God's will. That to please the supreme fountain of truth your readiest method, now and then, was to persist in believing what your whole soul found to be doubtful or incredible. That poor human symbols were higher than the God Almighty's facts they symbolized, that formulas, with or without the facts symbolized by them were sacred and salutary, that formulas, well persisted in, could still save us when the facts were all fled. A new revelation to mankind, not heard of in human experience, till Ignatius revealed it to us. That, in substance, was the contribution of Ignatius to the well-being of mankind. Under that thrice Stygian gospel we have all of us, papist and at length Protestant too, this long while sat, a doctrine of devils, I do think, if there ever was one, and are now, ever since 1789, with endless misery and astonishment, confusedly awakening out of the same, uncertain whether toward swift agony of social death, or toward slow martyrdom of recovery into spiritual and social life. Not that poor Loyola did all the feet himself, any more than Luther, Robespierre and other such did in the parallel cases. By no means. Not in his poor person shall the wretched Loyola bear the guilt of poisoning the world, the world was, as it were, in quest of poison, in the sure course of being poisoned, and would have got it done by some one, Loyola is the historical symbol to us of its being done. The most conspicuous and ostentatious of the world's poisoners, who, solemnly consecrating all the rest in the name of holiness or spiritual health, has got the work of poisoning to go on with never imagined completeness and acceleration in all quarters, and is worthy to have it called after him a Jesuitism, and be blamed by men, how judged by God, we know not, for doing it. That it is done, there is the sad fact for us, which infinitely concerns every living soul of us, what Ignatius God or is to get for doing it, this shall not concern us at all. And so, before dismissing busy English readers to their autumnal grouse shooting, the Ramadan, sacred fast, or month of meditative solitude and devout prayer, now in use among the English, I have one sad thing to do, lead them a little to the survey of Ignatius and our universal Jesuitism, and ask them, in heaven's name, if they will answer such a question. What they think of it, and of their share in it. For this is the central and parent phenomenon, the great Tartarian deep, this, whence all our miseries, fatuities, futilities spring, the accursed Helis realm, tenanted by foul creatures, ministers of death eternal, out of which poor mortals, each for himself, are called to escape if they can. Who is there that can escape, that can become alive to the terrible necessity of escaping? By way of finish to this offensive and alarming set of pamphlets, I have still one crowning offense and alarm to try if I can give. The message, namely, that under all those cannibal connaughts, distressed needlewomen, and other woes nigh grown intolerable, there lies a still deeper infinite of woe and guilt, chargeable on every one of us, and that till this abate, essentially those never will or can that our English solitaries, any noticeable number of them, in their grouse Ramadan, or elsewhere, will accept the message, and see this thing for my poor showing, is more than I expect. Not willingly or joyfully do men become conscious that they are afloat, they and their affairs, upon the pool of Erebus, now nameless in polite speech, and that all their miseries, social and private, are found in springing out of that, and like to spring perennially with ever more copiousness, till once you get away from that. And yet who knows? 
Here and there a thinking English soul, the reflection, the devotion, not yet quite deafened out of him by perpetual noise and babble, such a soul left silent in the solitude of some highland quarry, waiting perhaps till the gillies drive his deer up to him, may catch a glimpse of it, take a thought of it, may prosecute his thought, fling down with terror, his Joe Manton and percussion caps, and fly to a better kind of Ramadan, towards another kind of life. Sure enough, if one in the thousand see it all, in this sad matter, what I see and have long seen in it, his life either suddenly or gradually will alter in several particulars, and his sorrow, apprehension and amazement will probably grow upon him, the longer he considers this affair, and his life, I think, will alter ever farther, and he, this one in a thousand, will forgive me, and be thankful to the heavens and me, while he continues in this world or in any world. The spiritual, it is still often said, but is not now sufficiently considered, is the parent and first cause of the practical. The spiritual everywhere originates the practical, models it, makes it, so that the saddest external condition of affairs, among men, is but evidence of a still sadder internal one. For as thought is the life fountain and motive soul of action, so, in all regions of this human world, whatever outward thing offers itself to the eye, is merely the garment or body of a thing which already existed invisibly within, which, striving to give itself expression, has found, in the given circumstances, that it could and would express itself, so. This is everywhere true, and in these times when men's attention is directed outward rather, this deserves far more attention than it will receive. Do you ask why misery abounds among us? I bid you look into the notion we have formed for ourselves of this universe, and of our duties and destinies there. If it is a true notion, we shall strenuously reduce it to practice, for who dare or can contradict his faith, whatever it may be, in the eternal fact that is around him. And thereby blessings and success will attend us in said universe, or eternal fact we live amidst, of that surely there is no doubt. All revelations and intimations, heavenly and earthly, assure us of that, only a philosophy of Bedlam could throw a doubt on that. Blessings and success, most surely, if our notion of this universe, and our battle in it be a true one, not curses and futilities, except it be not true. For battle, in any case, I think we shall not want, harsh wounds, and the heat of the day, we shall have to stand, but it will be a noble godlike and human battle, not an ignoble devil-like and brutal one, and our wounds, and sore toils, what we in our impatience call miseries comma will themselves be blessed to us. But if, on the other hand, it were a false notion which we believed, Alas, if it were even a false notion which we only pretended to believe? What battle can there be, in that latter fatal case? Our faith, or notion of this universe, is not false only, but it is the father of falsity, a thing that destroys itself, and is equivalent to the death of all notion, all belief or motive to action, except what the appetites and the astucities may yield. We have then the thrice baleful universe of Kant, prophesied for these latter days, and no battle, but a kind of bigger Donnybrook one, is possible for hapless mortals till that altar. Faith, fact, performance, in all high and gradually in all low departments, go about their business, inanity well tailored and upholstered, mild spoken ambiguity, decorous hypocrisy which is astonished you should think it hypocritical, taking their room and drawing their wages, from zenith to nadir, you have can't, can't, a universe of incredibilities which are not even credited, which each man at best only tries to persuade himself that he credits. Do you expect a divine battle, with noble victories, out of this? I expect a Hudson statue from it, brisk trade in scrip, with distressed needlewomen, cannibal connots, and other the like phenomena, such as we now everywhere see. Indisputably enough, what notion each forms of the universe is the all-regulating fact with regard to him. The universe makes no immediate objection to be conceived in any way, pictures itself as plainly in the seeing faculty of Newton's dog diamond, as of Newton, and yields to each a result accurately corresponding. To the dog diamond dogs meet, with its adjuncts, better or worse, to Newton discovery of the system of the stars. Not the universe's affair at all, but the seeing party's affair very much, for the results to each correspond, with exact proportion, to his notion of it. The saddest condition of human affairs, what ancient prophets denounced as the throne of iniquity, where men decree injustice by a law, all this, with its thousandfold outer miseries, is still but a symptom. All this points to a far sadder disease which lies invisible within. In new dialect, whatever modified interpretation we may put upon it, the same must be said as in old, God's judgments are abroad in the world, and it would much behove many of us to know well that the essential fact lies there and not elsewhere. If we sin against God, it is most certain God's judgments will overtake us, and whether we recognize them as God's message like men, or merely rage and writhe under them like dogs, and in our blind agony, each imputing it to his neighbor, tear one another in pieces under them, it is certain they will continue upon us, till we either cease sinning, 
or are all torn in pieces and annihilated. Widespread suffering, mutiny and delirium, the hot rage of sanskalotic insurrections, the cold rage of resuscitated tyrannies, the brutal degradation of the millions, the pampered frivolity of the units, that awful unheeded spectacle, the throne of iniquity decreeing injustice by a law, as the gist I can see it everywhere doing, certainly something must be wrong in the inner man of the world, since its outer man is so terribly out of square. The deliverer of the world, therefore, were not he who headed sanskalotic insurrections never so successful, but he who pointed out to the world what nightmares were resting over its soul. Ignatius Loyola, and the innumerable company, Papist, Protestant, Sham Christian, Antichristian, that have believed his revelation, universal prevalence, from pole to pole, of such a doctrine of devils, reverent or quasi-reverent faith in the dead human formulas, and somnolent contempt of the divine ever-living facts, such as reigns now, consecrated in Sue 23 Rem, in all commonwealths and countries, and hearts of men, the human species as it were, unconsciously or consciously, gone all to one sodality of Jesuitism, who will deliver us from the body of this death. It is in truth like death in life, a living criminal, as in the old Roman days, with a corpse lashed fast to him. What wretch could have deserved such a doom? As to this Ignatius, I am aware he is admired, and even transcendently admired, or what we call worshipped, by multitudes of human creatures, who to this day expect, or endeavor to expect, some kind of salvation from him, whom it is so painful to enrage against me, if I could avoid it. Undoubtedly Ignatius, centuries ago, gave satisfaction to the devil's advocate, the Pope and other parties interested, was canonized, named saint, and raised duly into heaven officially so-called, whereupon, with many, he passes, ever since, for a kind of God, or person who has much influence with the gods. Alas, the admiration, and transcendent admiration, of mankind, goes a strange road in these times. Hudson too had his canonization, and by Vox Populi, if not by Pope and Devil's Advocate, was raised to a kind of brass Olympus by mankind, and rode there for a year or two, though he is already gone to warming pans again. A poor man, in our day, has many gods foisted on him, and big voices bid him, worship or be. In a menacing and confusing manner. What shall he do? By far the greater part of said gods, current in the public, whether canonized by Pope or populace, are mere dumb apices and beatified prize oxen, nay some of them, who have articulate faculty, are devils instead of gods. A poor man that would save his soul alive is reduced to the sad necessity of sharply trying his gods whether they are divine or not, which is a terrible pass for mankind, and lays an awful problem upon each man. The man must do it, however. At his own peril he will have to do this problem too, which is one of the awfulest, and his neighbors, all but a most select portion of them, portion generally not clad in official tiaras, can be of next to no help to him in it, nay rather will infinitely hinder him in it, as matters go. If Ignatius, worshipped by millions as a kind of god, is, in eternal fact, a kind of devil, or enemy of whatsoever is godlike in man's existence, surely it is pressingly expedient that men were made aware of it, that men, with whatever earnestness is yet in them, laid it awfully to heart. Prim friend with the black serge gown, with the rosary, scapulary, and I know not what other spiritual block and tackle, scowl not on me. If in thy poor heart, under its rosaries, there dwell any human piety, awestruck reverence towards the Supreme Maker, devout compassion towards this poor earth and her sons, scowl not anathema on me, listen to me, for I swear thou art my brother, in spite of rosaries and scapularies, and I recognize thee, though thou canst not me, and with love and pity know thee for a brother, though enchanted into the condition of a spiritual mummy. Hapless creature, curse me not, listen to me, and consider, perhaps even thou wilt escape from mummyhood, and become once more a living soul. Of Ignatius, then, I must take leave to say, there can this be recorded, that probably he has done more mischief in the earth than any man born since. A scandalous mortal, brethren of mankind who live by truth and not by falsity, I must call this man. Altogether, here where I stand, looking on millions of poor pious brothers reduced to spiritual mummyhood, who curse me because I try to speak the truth to them, and on a whole world canting and grimacing from birth to death, and finding in their life two serious indubitabilities. Kukri and Scrip, how, if he is the representative and chief fountain of all this, can I call him other than the superlative of scandals? A bad man, I think, not good by nature, and by destiny swollen into a very armament of badness. Not good by nature, I perceive. A man born greedy, whose greatness in the beginning, and even in the end if we will look well, is indicated chiefly by the depth of his appetite, not the recommendable kind of man. A man full of prurient elements from the first, which at the last, through his long course, 
have developed themselves over the family of mankind into an expression altogether tremendous. A young Spanish soldier and Hidalgo with hot Biscayne blood, distinguished, as I understand, by his fierce appetites chiefly, by his audacities and sensualities, and loud unreasonable decision, that this universe, in spite of rumours to the contrary was a cookery shop and bordel, wherein garlic, Jamaica pepper, unfortunate females and other spicery and garnishing awaited the bold human appetite, and the rest of it was mere rumour and moonshine, with this life theory and practice had Ignatius lived some thirty years, a hot human papon's digester and little other, when, on the walls of Pompeluna, the destined cannon shot shattered both his legs, leaving his head, hitting only his legs, so the destinies would have it, and he fell at once totally prostrate, a wrecked papon's digester, lay many weeks horizontal, and had in that tedious posture to commence a new series of reflections. He began to perceive now that the rest of it was not mere rumour and moonshine, that the rest was, in fact, the whole secret of the matter. That the cookery shop and bordel was a magical delusion, a sleight of hand of Satan, to lead Ignatius down, by garlic and finer temporal spiceries, to eternal hell, and that in short he, Ignatius, had lived hitherto as a degraded ferocious human pig, one of the most perfect scoundrels, and was, at that date, no other than a blot on creation, and a scandal to mankind. With which set of reflections who could quarrel? The reflections were true, were salutary, nay there was something of sacred in them, as in the repentance of man, in the discovery by erring man that wrong is not right, that wrong differs from right as deep hell from high heaven there ever is. Ignatius's soul was in convulsions, in agonies of new birth, for which I honour Ignatius. Human sincerity could not but have told him. Yes, in several respects, thou art a detestable human pig, and disgrace to the family of man, for which it behoves thee to be a nameless remorse, till thy life either mend or end. Consider, there is thou liest with thy two legs smashed, the peck and element that is in thee, discover it, rigorously tear it out, reflect what farther thou wilt do. A life yet remains, to be led, clearly, in some new manner, how wilt thou lead it? Sit silent for the rest of thy days. In some most modest seclusion, hide thyself from a human kind which has been dishonoured by thee. Thy sin being pruriency of appetite, give that at least no farther scope under any old or new form? I admit, the question was not easy. Think, in this is wrecked horizontal position, what could or should the poor individual called Inigo, Ignatius, or whatever the first name of him was, have done? Truly for Ignatius the question was very complicated. But, had he asked from nature and the eternal oracles a remedy for wrecked sensualism, here surely was one thing that would have suggested itself, to annihilate his pruriency. To cower, silent and ashamed, into some dim corner, and resolve to make henceforth as little noise as possible. That would have been modest, salutary, that might have led to many other virtues, and gradually to all. That, I think, is what the small still voices would have told Ignatius, could he have heard them amid the loud bullyings and liturgyings, but he couldn't, perhaps he never tried, and that, accordingly, was not what Ignatius resolved upon. In fact, Christian doctrine, backed by all the human wisdom I could ever hear of, inclines me to think that Ignatius, had he been a good and brave man, should have consented, at this point, to be damned, as was clear to him that he deserved to be. Here would have been a healing solace to his conscience, one transcendent act of virtue which it still lay with him, the worst of sinners, to do. To die forever, as I have deserved, let eternal justice triumph so, by means of me and my foul scandals, since otherwise it may not. Selbstatung, annihilation of self, justly reckon the beginning of all virtue, here is the highest form of it, still possible to the lowest man. The voice of nature this, to a repentant outcast sinner turning again towards the realms of manhood, and I understand it is the precept of all right Christianity too. But no, Ignatius could not, in his lowest abasement, consent to have justice done on him, not on him, ah no, and there lay his crime and his misfortune, which has brought such penalty on him and us. The truth is, it was not of eternal nature in her oracles that Ignatius inquired, poor man, it was of temporary art in hers, and they sang not of self-annihilation, or Ignatius would not hear that part of their song. Not so did Ignatius read the omens. My pruriency being terribly forbidden on one side, let it, thought Ignatius, deeply unconscious of such a thought, have terrible course on another. Garlic cookery and such like excitations are accursed to me forever, but cannot I achieve something that shall still assert my ego I in a highly gratifying manner? Alas, human sincerity, hard as his scourging had been, was not quite attainable by him. In his frantic just agonies, he flung himself before the shrine of Virgin Marys, saints of the Romish calendar, three-hatted holy fathers, and uncertain thaumaturgic entities, praying that he might be healed by miracle, not by course of nature, and that, for one most fatal item, 
his pruriency of appetite might, under new and verse forms, continue with him. Which prayer, we may say, was granted. In the depths of his despair, all nature glooming veritable reprobation on him and eternal justice whispering, accept what thou hast merited, there rose this altogether turrid semi-artificial glare of hope upon Ignatius, the virgin will save me, the virgin has saved me, well and good, I say, then be quiet, and let us see some temperance and modesty in you. Far otherwise did Ignatius resolve, temperance and true modesty were not among the gifts of this precious individual the virgin had been at the pains to save. Many plans Ignatius tried to make his ego eye still available on earth, and still keep heaven open for him. His pilgrimings and battlings, his silent sufferings and wrestlings for that object, are enormous, and reach the highest pitch of the prurient heroic. At length, after various failures and unsatisfactory half-successes, it struck him. Has not there lately been a sort of revolt against the Virgin, and the Holy Father who takes care of her? Certain infernal heresiarchs in Germany and elsewhere, I am told, have risen up against the Holy Father, arguing with terrible plausibility that he is an unholy phantasm, he, and if so, what am I in my outlooks? A new light, presumably of hell, has risen to that effect, which new light, why cannot I bow here and consecrate myself, to battle against, and with my whole strength endeavor to extinguish? That was the task Ignatius fixed upon as his, and if that he has been busy, he in an immense and ever-increasing sodality of mortals, these three hundred years, and through various fortune, they have brought it thus far. Truly to one of the most singular predicaments the affairs of mankind ever stood in before. If the new light is of hell, Ignatius, write that if of heaven there is not, that I know of, any equally damnable sin is thine. No, thy late pighood itself is trivial in comparison. Frantic mortal, wilt thou, at the bidding of any papa, war against Almighty God? Is there no inspiration, then, but an ancient Jewish, Greekish, Romish one, with big revenues, loud liturgies and red stockings? The Pope is old, but eternity, thou shalt observe, is older. High treason against all the universe is dangerous to do. Quench not among us, I advise thee, the monitions of that thrice sacred gospel, holier than all gospels, which dwells in each man direct from the Maker of him. Frightfully will it be avenged on thee, and on all that follow thee, to the sixth generation and farther, all men shall lie under this gigantic upas tree thou hast been planning, terribly will the gods avenge it on thee, and on all thy father Adam's house. Ignatius S. Black Militia, armed with this precious message of salvation, have now been campaigning over all the world for about three hundred years, and openly or secretly have done a mighty work over all the world. Who can count what a work? Where you meet a man believing in the salutary nature of falsehoods, or the divine authority of things doubtful, and fancying that to serve the good cause he must call the devil to his aid, there is a follower of unsane Ignatius, not till the last of these men has vanished from the earth will our account with Ignatius be quite settled, and his black militia have got their minimus to chaos again. They have given a new substantive to modern languages. The word Jesuitism now, in all countries, expresses an idea for which there was in nature no prototype before. Not till these late centuries had the human soul generated that abomination, or needed to name it. Truly they have achieved great things in the world, and a general result which we ma call stupendous. Not victory for Ignatius and the black militia, no, till the universe itself become a cunningly devised fable, and God the Maker abdicate in favor of Beelzebub, I do not see how victory can fall on that side. But they have done such deadly execution on the general soul of man, and have wrought such havoc on the terrestrial and supernal interests of this world, as ensured a Jesuitism a long memory in human annals. How many three-hatted papas, and scandalous consecrated phantasms, cleric and laic, convicted or not yet suspected to be phantasms and servants of the devil and not of God, does it still retain an existence in all corners of this afflicted world? Germany had its war of thirty years, among other wars, on this subject, and had there not been elsewhere a nobler loyalty to God's cause than was to be found in Germany at that date, Ignatius with his rosaries and gibbet ropes, with his honey-mouthed father's Lammerlane and black serge, and heavy-fisted father's Wallenstein and chain armor, must have carried it, and that alarming Lutheran new light would have been got extinguished again. The continent once well quenched out, it was calculated England might soon be made to follow, and then the whole world were blessed with orthodoxy. So it had been computed. But Gustavus, a man prepared to die if needful, Gustavus with his Swedes appeared upon the scene, nay shortly Oliver Cromwell with his Puritans appeared upon it, and the computation quite broke down. Beyond seas and within seas, the Wallensteins and Lammerlanes, the Hyacinths and Andreas Habernfelds, the Lods and Charleses, in fine, Ignatius and all that held of him, had to cower into their holes again, and try it by new methods. Many were their methods, their fortune various, and ever and anon, 
To the hope or the terror of this and the other man of weak judgment, it has seemed that victory was just about to crown Ignatius. True, too true, the execution done upon the soul of mankind has been enormous and tremendous, but victory to Ignatius there has been none, and will and can be none. Nay at last, ever since 1789 and 93, the figure of the quarrel has much altered, and the hope for Ignatius, except to here and there a man of weak judgment, has become a flat impossibility. For Luther and Protestantism proper having, so to speak, withdrawn from the battlefield, as entities whose work was done, there then appeared on it Jean Jacques and French Sanscalotism, to which all creatures have gradually joined themselves. Whereby now we have Protestantism improper, a Protestantism universal and illimitable on the part of all men, the whole world risen into anarchic mutiny, with pike and paving stone, swearing by heaven above and also by hell beneath, by the eternal yea and the eternal no, that Ignatius and imposture shall not rule them any more, neither in soul nor in body nor in breeches pocket any more, but that they will go unruled rather, as they hope it will be possible for them to do. This is Ignatius's destruction of Protestantism, he has destroyed it into Sanskalatism, such a form of all-embracing Protestantism as was never dreamt of by the human soul before. So that now, at last, there is hope of final death and rest to Ignatius and his labors. Ignatius, I perceive, is now sure to die, and be abolished before long, nay is already dead, and will not even galvanize much farther, but, in fine, is hourly sinking towards the abyss, dragging much along with him thither. Whole worlds along with him, such continents of things, once living and beautiful, now dead and horrible, things once sacred, now not even commonly profane, fearful and wonderful, to every thinking heart and seeing eye, in these days. That is the answer, slowly enunciated, but irrevocable and indubitable, which Ignatius gets in heaven's high court, when he appeals there, asking, am I a sanctus or not, as the papa and his devil's advocate told me I was. The vivaciousness of Jesuitism is much spoken of, as a thing creditable. And truly it is remarkable, though I think in the way of wonder even more than of admiration, what a quantity of killing it does require. To say nothing of the Cromwells and Gustavuses, and what they did, they and theirs, it is near a century now since Pombal and Aranda, secular and not divine men, yet useful antiseptic products of their generation, felt called, if not consciously by heaven, then by earth which is unconsciously a bit of heaven, to cut down this scandal from the world, and make the earth rid of Jesuitism for one thing. What a wide-sweeping shear they gave it, as with the sudden scythe of universal death, is well known, and how, mown down from side to side of the world in one day, it had to lie sorrowfully slain and withering under the sun. After all which, nay after 1793 itself, does not Jesuitism still pretend to be alive, and in this year 1850, still, by dint of steady galvanism, shows some quivering in its fingers and toes? Vivacious, sure enough, and I suppose there must be reasons for it, which it is well to note withal. But what if such vivaciousness were, in good part, like that of evil weeds, if the strength of Jesuitism were like that of typhus fever, not a recommendable kind of strength? I hear much also of obedience, how that and the kindred virtues are prescribed and exemplified by Jesuitism, the truth of which, and the merit of which, far be it from me to deny. Obedience, a virtue universally forgotten in these days, will have to become universally known again. Obedience is good, and indispensable, but if it be obedience to what is wrong and false, good heavens, there is no name for such a depth of human cowardice and calamity, spurned everlastingly by the gods. Loyalty? Will you be loyal to Beelzebub? Will you make a covenant with death and hell? Question mark. I will not be loyal to Beelzebub, I will become a nomadic shaktar rather, a barricading sansculot, a conciliation hall repealer, anything and everything is venial to that. The virtues of Jesuitism, seasoned with that fatal condiment, are other than quite virtuous. To cherish pious thoughts, and assiduously keep your eye directed to a heaven that is not real, will that yield divine life to you, or hideous galvanic life in death? To cherish many quasi-human virtues, really many possibilities of virtue, and wed them all to the principle that God can be served by believing what is not true, to put out the sacred lamp of intellect within you, to decide on maiming yourself of that higher godlike gift, which God Himself has given you with a silent but awful charge in regard to it, to be bullied and bow out out of your loyal carrot to the God of light by big phantasms and three-hatted chimeras, can I call that by the name of nobleness or human courage? Could not help it, say you? If a man cannot help it, a man must allow me to say he is unfortunately given the most conspicuous proof of caitiffhood that lay within his human possibility, and he must cease to brag to me about his virtues, in that sad case. But, in fact, the character of the poor creature named Ignatius, whether it be good or bad and worst, concerns us little, not even that of the specific Jesuit body concerns us much. 
the Jesuits proper have long since got their final minimus from England. Nor, in the 17th century, with an ubiquitous alarming Toby Matthews, Andreas Habernfeld and company, with their father Hyacinth, and hero William Laud and Charles I, was this by any means so light a business as we now fancy. But it has been got accomplished. Long now have the English people understood the Jesuits proper, in so far as they are not nothing, which is the commonest case, are servants of the Prince of Darkness, by Puritan Cromwelliads on the great scale, and on the small by diligent hunting, confinement in the clink prison, and judicial tribulation, let us say, by earnest pious thought and fight, and the labors of the valiant born to us, this country has been tolerably cleared of Jesuits proper, nor is there danger of their ever coming to a head here again. But, alas, the expulsion of the Jesuit body avails us little, when the Jesuit soul has so nestled itself in the life of mankind everywhere. What we have to complain of is, that all men are become Jesuits. That no man speaks the truth to you or to himself, but that every man lies, with blasphemous audacity, and does not know that he is lying, before God and man, in regard to almost all manner of things. This is the fell heritage bequeathed us by Ignatius, to this sad stage has our battle with him come. Consider it, good reader, and yet alas, if thou be not one of a thousand, what is the use of bidding thee consider it? The deadliest essence of the curse we now labor under is that the light of our inner eyesight is gone out, that such things are not discernible by considering, can't and even sincere can't, O oh heaven, when a man doing if his sincerest is still but canting. For tins is the sad condition of the insincere man, he is doomed all his days to deal with insincerities, to live, move, and have his being in traditions and conventionalities. If the traditions have grown old, the conventionalities will be mostly false, true in no sense can they be for him, never shall he behold the truth if any matter, formulas, theologic, economic and other, certain superficial readings of truth, required in the marketplace, these he will take with him, these he will apply dexterously, and with these he will have to satisfy himself. Sincerity shall not exist for him, he shall think that he has found it, while it is yet far away. The deep, awful and indeed divine quality of truth that lies in every object, and in virtue of which the object exists, from his poor eyes this is forever hidden. Not with austere divine realities which belong, to the universe and to eternity, but with paltry ambiguous phantasms, comfortable and uncomfortable, which belong to his own parish, and to the current week or generation, shall he pass his days. There had been liars in the world, alas, never since the old serpent tempted Eve, had the world been free of liars, neither will it be, but there was in this of Jesuit Ignatius an apotheosis of falsity, a kind of subtle quintessence and deadly virus of lying, the like of which had never been seen before. Measure it, if you can, prussic acid and chloroform are poor to it. Men had served the devil, and men had very imperfectly served God but to think that God could be served more perfectly by taking the devil into partnership, this was a novelty of St. Ignatius. And this is now no novelty, to such extent has the Jesuit chloroform stupefied us all. This is the universal faith and practice, for several generations past, of the class called good men in this world. They are in general mutineers, sans gulots, angry disorderly persons, and a class rather worthy to be called bad, who hitherto assert the contrary of this. Be careful how you believe truth, cries the good man everywhere, composure and a whole skin are very valuable. Truth, who knows? Many things are not true, most things are uncertainties, very prosperous things are even open falsities that have been agreed upon. There is little certain truth going. If it isn't orthodox truth, it will play the very devil with you. Did the human species ever lie in such a soak of horrors, sunk like steeping flax under the widespread fetid hell waters, in all spiritual respects dead, dead, voiceless towards heaven for centuries back? merely sending up, in the form of mute prayer, such an odor as the angels never smelt before. It has to lie there, till the worthless part has been rotted out, till much has been rotted out, I do perceive, and perhaps the time has come when the precious lint fiber itself is in danger, and men, if they are not delivered, will cease to be men, or to be at all. O oh heavens, with divine Hudson on this hand, and divine Ignatius on that, and the Gorm controversy going on, and the Irish tenant agitation, which will soon become a Scotch and an English ditto, just about beginning, is not the hour now nearly come? Words fail us when we would speak of what Ignatius has done for men. Probably the most virulent form of sin which the old serpent has yet rejoiced in on our poor earth. For me it is the deadliest high treason against God our Maker which the soul of man could commit. And this, then, is the horrible conclusion we have arrived at, in England as in all countries, and with less protest against it hitherto, and not with more, in England than in other countries? that the great body of orderly considerate men, men affecting the name of good and pious, and who, in fact, excluding certain silent exceptionary individuals one to the million, 
such as the Almighty Beneficence never quite withholds, are accounted our best men, have unconsciously abnegated the sacred privilege and duty of acting or speaking the truth, and fancy that it is not truth that is to be acted, but that an amalgam of truth and falsity is the safe thing. In Parliament and pulpit, in book and speech, in whatever spiritual thing men have to commune of, or to do together, this is the rule they have lapsed into, this is the pass they have arrived at. We have to report that human speech is not true. That it is false to a degree never witnessed in this world till lately. Such a subtle virus of falsity in the very essence of it, as far excels all open lying, or prior kinds of falsity, false with consciousness of being sincere. The heart of the world is corrupted to the core, a detestable devil's poison circulates in the lifeblood of mankind, taints with abominable deadly malady all that mankind do. Such a curse never fell on men before. For the falsity of speech rests on a far deeper falsity. False speech, as is inevitable when men long practice it, falsifies all things, the very thoughts, or fountains of speech and action become false. Ere long, by the appointed curse of heaven, a man's intellect ceases to be capable of distinguishing truth, when he permits himself to deal in speaking or acting what is false. Watch well the tongue, for out of it are the issues of life. Oh, the foul leprosy that heaps itself in monstrous accumulation over human life, and obliterates all the divine features of it into one hideous mountain of purulent disease, when human life parts company with truth, and fancies, taught by Ignatius or another, that lies will be the salvation of it. We of these late centuries have suffered as the sons of Adam never did before, hebetated, sunk under mountains of torpid leprosy, and studying to persuade ourselves that this is health. And if we have awakened from the sleep of death into the sorcerer's Sabbath of anarchy, is it not the chief of blessings that we are awake at all? Thanks to transcendent Sanskulatism and the long memorable French Revolution, the one veritable and tremendous gospel of these bad ages, divine gospel such as we deserved, and merciful too, though preached in thunder and terror. Napoleon campaignings, September massacres, reigns of terror, Anacarsis clutes, and Pontiff Robespierre, and still more beggarly tragicalities that we have since seen, and are still to see, what frightful thing were not a little less frightful than the thing we had. Peremptory was our necessity of putting Jesuitism away, of awakening to the consciousness of Jesuitism, horrible, yes, how could it be other than horrible? Like the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it lies round us, one nightmare wilderness, and wreck of dead men's bones, this false modern world, and no rapt Ezekiel and prophetic vision image to himself things sadder, more horrible and terrible, than the eyes of men, if they are awake, may now deliberately see. Many yet sleep, but the sleep of all, as we judge by their maundering and jargoning, their gorm controversies, street barricadings, and uneasy tossings and somnambulisms, is not far from ending. Novalis says, we are near awakening when we dream that we are dreaming. A man's religion consists not of the many things he is in doubt of and tries to believe, but of the few he is assured of, and has no need of effort for believing. His religion, whatever it may be, is a discerned fact, and coherent system of discerned facts to him. He stands fronting the worlds and the eternities upon it, to doubt of it is not permissible at all. He must verify or expel his doubts, convert them into certainty of yes or no, or they will be the death of his religion. But, on the other hand, convert them into certainty of yes and no, or even of yes though no, as the Ignatian method is, what will become of your religion? Let us glance a little at this strange aspect of our affairs. What a man's or nation's available religion at any time is, may sometimes, especially if he abound in bishops, gorum controversies, and richly endowed churches and church practices, be difficult to say. For a nation which, under very peculiar circumstances, closed its Bible about two hundred years ago, hanged the dead body of its Cromwell, and accepted one Charles II for defender of its faith so-called. For such a nation, which has closed its Bible, and decided that the sufficient and much handier practice would be to kiss the outside of said Bible, and in all senses swear zealously by the same without opening it again, the question what its religion is, may naturally be involved in obscurities. Such dramaturgic fugal worship going on everywhere, and kissing of the closed Bible, what real worship, religion, or recognition of a divine necessity in nature and life, there may be, or, in fact, is there any left at all? Very little, I should say. The religion of a man in these strange circumstances, what living conviction he has about his destiny in this universe, falls into a most strange condition, and, in truth, I have observed, is apt to take refuge in the stomach mainly. The man goes through his prescribed fugal motions at church and elsewhere, keeping his conscience and sense of decency at ease thereby, and in some empty part of his brain, if he have fancy left, or brain other than a beaver's, there goes on occasionally some dance of dreamy hypotheses, sentimental echoes, shadows, and other inane make-believes, 
which I think are quite the contrary of a possession to him, leading to no clear faith, or divine life and death certainty of any kind, but to a torpid species of delirium somnians and delirium sturtons rather. In his head or in his heart this man has of available religion none. But descend into his stomach, purse in the adjacent regions, you then do awaken, even in the very last extremity, a set of divine beliefs, were it only belief in the multiplication table, and certain coarser outward forms of mayum and tuum. He believes in the inalienable nature of purchased beef, in the duty of the British citizen to fight for himself when injured, and other similar faiths, an actual religion of its sort, or revelation of what the Almighty Maker means with him in this earth, and has irrefragably, as by direct inspiration, charged him to do. This is the man's religion, this poor scantling of divine convictions which you find lying, mostly inarticulate, in deep sleep at the bottom of his stomach, and have such difficulty in raising into any kind of elocution or conscious wakefulness. Alas, so much of him, his soul almost holy, is not only asleep there, but gone drowned and dead. The religion you awaken in him is often of a very singular quality, enough to make the observer pause in silence. Such a religion, issuing practically in Hudson statues, and, alas, also in distressed needlewomen, cannibal connaughts, and remedial measures suited to the occasion, was never seen among Adam's posterity before. But it is this modern man's religion, all the religion you will get of him. And if you can winnow out the fugal motions, fantasies, sentimentalisms, make-believes, and other multitudinous chaff, so that his religion stands before you in its net condition, you may contemplate it with scientific astonishment, with innumerable reflections, and may perhaps draw wise inferences from it. A singular piece of scribble, in Sourtake's hand, bearing marks of haste and almost of rage, for the words, abbreviated to the bone, tumble about as if in battle on the paper, occurs to me at this moment, entitled Schweinsch well tansicht, and I will try to decipher and translate it. Pink philosophy. If the inestimable talent of literature should, in these swift days of progress, be extended to the brute creation, having fairly taken in all the human, so that swine and oxen could communicate to us on paper what they thought of the universe, there might curious results, not uninstructive to some of us, ensue. Supposing swine, I mean four-footed swine, of sensibility and superior logical parts, had attained such culture, and could, after survey and reflection, jot down for us their notion of the universe, and of their interests and duties there, might it not well interest a discerning public, perhaps in unexpected ways, and give a stimulus to the languishing book trade? The votes of all creatures, it is understood at present, ought to be had, that you may legislate for them with better insight. How can you govern a thing, say many, without first asking its vote? Unless, indeed, you already chance to know its vote, and even something more, namely, what you are to think of its vote, what it wants by its vote, and still more important, what nature wants, which latter, at the end of the account, is the only thing that will be got. Pig propositions, in a rough form, are somewhat as follows. 1. The universe, so far as sane conjecture can go, is an immeasurable swine's trough, consisting of solid and liquid, and of other contrasts and kinds, especially consisting of attainable and unattainable the latter in immensely greater quantities for most pigs. 2. Moral evil is unattainability of pig's wash, moral good, attainability of ditto. 3. What is paradise, or the state of innocence? Paradise, called also state of innocence, age of gold, and other names, was, according to pigs of weak judgment, unlimited attainability of pig's wash, perfect fulfillment of one's wishes, so that the pig's imagination could not outrun reality, a fable and an impossibility, as pigs of sense now see. 4. Define the whole duty of pigs. It is the mission of universal pighood, and the duty of all pigs, at all times, to diminish the quantity of unattainable and increase that of attainable. All knowledge and device and effort ought to be directed thither and thither only, pig science, pig enthusiasm and devotion have this one aim. It is the whole duty of pigs. 5. Pig poetry ought to consist of universal recognition of the excellence of pigs wash and ground barley, and the felicity of pigs whose trough is in order, and who have had enough, rump. 6. The pig knows the weather, he ought to look out what kind of weather it will be. 7. Who made the pig? Unknown, perhaps the pork butcher? 8. Have you law and justice in pigdom? Pigs of observation have discerned that there is, or was once supposed to be, a thing called justice. Undeniably at least there is a sentiment in pig nature called indignation, revenge, etc., which, if one pig provoke another, comes out in a more or less destructive manner, hence laws are necessary, amazing quantities of laws. For quarreling is attended with loss of blood, of life, at any rate with frightful effusion of the general stock of hogswash, and ruin, temporary ruin, 
to large sections of the universal swine's trough, wherefore let justice be observed, that so quarreling be avoided. 9. What is justice? Your own share of the general swine's trough, not any portion of my share. 10. But what is my share? Ah. There in fact lies the grand difficulty, upon which pig science, meditating this long while, can settle absolutely nothing. My share, rumpf, my share is, on the whole, whatever I can contrive to get without being hanged or sent to the hulks. For there are gibbets, treadmills, I need not tell you, and rules which lawyers have prescribed. 11. Who are lawyers? Servants of God, appointed revealers of the oracles of God, who read off to us from day to day what is the eternal commandment of God in reference to the mutual claims of His creatures in this world. 12. Where do they find that written? In Coke upon Littleton. 13. Who made Coke? Unknown, the maker of Coke's wig is discoverable. What became of Coke? Died. And then? Went to the undertaker, went to the. But we must pull up, Sourtag's fierce humor, confounding ever farther in his haste the four-footed with the two-footed animal, rushes into wilder and wilder forms of satirical torch dancing, and threatens to end in a universal rape of the wigs, which in a person of his character looks ominous and dangerous. Here, for example, is his fifty-first proposition, as he calls it. 1. What are bishops? Overseers of souls. What is a soul? The thing that keeps the body alive. How do they oversee that? They tie on a kind of aprons, publish charges, I believe they pray dreadfully, macerate themselves nearly dead with continual grief that they cannot in the least oversee it. And are much honored? By the wise very much. 2. Define the church. I had rather not. Do you believe in a future state yes, surely. What is it? Heaven, so called. To everybody. I understand so, hope so, what is it thought to be? Rumpf, no hell, then, at all. Rumpf. The fine arts are by some thought to be a kind of religion, the chief religion this poor Europe is to have in time coming, and undoubtedly it is in literature, poetry and the other kindred arts, where at least a certain manliness of temper, and liberty to follow truth, prevails or might prevail, that the world's chosen souls do now chiefly take refuge, and attempt what worship of the beautiful may still be possible for them. The poet in the fine arts, especially the poet in speech, what Fichte calls the scholar or the literary man, is defined by Fichte as the priest of these modern epics, all the priests they have. And indeed nature herself will teach us that the man born with what we call genius, which will mean, born with better and larger understanding than others, the man in whom the inspiration of the Almighty, given to all men, has a higher potentiality, that he, and properly he only, is the perpetual priest of men, ordained to the office by God himself, whether men can be so lucky as to get him ordained to it or not, nay, he does the office, too, after a sort, in this and in all epics. Ever must the fine arts be if not religious, yet indissolubly united to it, dependent on it, vitally blended with it as body is with soul. Why should I say, Ignatius Loyola ruined our fine arts? Ignatius thought not of the fine arts, nor is the guilt all his. Ignatius, intent on the heart of the matter, did but consecrate in the name of heaven, and religiously welcome his life in God, the universal death and the devil which of itself was preparing to come, on the fine arts as on all things. The fine arts are not what I most regret in the catastrophe so frightfully accelerated and consummated by him. If men's practical faith have become a pig philosophy, and their divine worship have become a mumbo-jumboism, soliciting in dumb agony either change to the very heart or else extinction and abolition, it matters little what their fine or other arts may be. All arts, industries and pursuits they have, are tainted to the heart with foul poison, carry not in them the inspiration of God, but, frightful to think of, that of the devil calling and thinking himself God and are smitten with a curse forevermore. What judgment the Academy of Cognoscenti may pronounce on them, is unimportant to me, what splendor of upholstery in French cookery, and temporary bullion at the bank, may be realized from them, is important to McCrowdy, not to me. Such bullion, I perceive well, can but be temporary, and if it were to be eternal, would bullion reconcile me to them? No, McCrowdy, never. Bullion, temporary bullion itself, awakens the hallelujah of flunkies, but even eternal bullion ought to make small impression upon men. To men I counted a human blessedness, and stern benignity of heaven, that when their course is false and ignoble, their bullion begins to leave them, that ultimate bankruptcy, and flat universal ruin, published in the Gazette, and palpable even to flunkies, follow step by step, at a longer or shorter interval, all solecisms under this sun. Certain a shadow follows substance, it is the oldest law of fate, and one good day, open ruin, bankruptcy and foul destruction, does overtake them all. 
Let us bless God for it. Were it otherwise, what end could there be of solecisms? The temporary paradise of quacks and flunkies were now an eternal paradise, how could the noble soul find harbor or patience in this world at all? This world were the inheritance of the ignoble, a very bedlam, as some skeptics have fancied it, made by malignant gods in their sport. But as to Jesuitism in the fine arts, and how its unsuspected thrice unblessed presence here too smites the genius of mankind with paralysis, there were much to be said. Sorrowful reflections lie in that, far beyond what a discerning public fancies in these days, reflections which cannot be entered upon, which can hardly be indicated afar off, at present. Here too, as elsewhere, the consummate flower of consecrated unveracity reigns supreme, and here as elsewhere peaceably presides over an enormous life and death. May the devil fly away with the fine arts, exclaimed confidentially once, in my hearing, one of our most distinguished public men, a sentiment that often recurs to me. I perceive too well how true it is, in our case. A public man, intent on any real business, does, I suppose, find the fine arts rather imaginary. The fine ales, wherever they turn up as business, whatever committee sit upon them, are sure to be the parent of much empty talk, laborious hypocrisy, dilettantism, futility, involving huge trouble and expense and babble, which end in no result, if not in worse than none, the practical man, in his moments of sincerity, feels them to be a pretentious nothingness, a confused superfluity and nuisance, purchased with cost, what he in brief language denominates a bore. It is truly so, in these degraded days, and the fine arts, among other fine interests of ours, are really called to recognize it, and see what they will do in it. For they are become the throne of hypocrisy, I think the highest of her many thrones, these said arts, which is very sad to consider. Nowhere, not even on a gala day in the Pope's Church of St. Peter, is there such an explosion of intolerable hypocrisy, on the part of poor mankind, as when you admit them into their royal picture gallery, glyptothek, museum, or other divine temple of the fine arts. Hypocrisy doubly intolerable, because it is not here, as in street, Peter's and some other churches, an obliged hypocrisy but a voluntary one. Nothing but your own vanity prompts you here to pretend worshipping, you are not bound to worship, and twaddle pretended raptures, criticisms and poetic recognitions, unless you like it, and you do not the least know what a damnable practice it is, or you wouldn't. I make a rule, these many years back, to speak almost nothing, and encourage no speech in picture galleries, to avoid company, even that of familiar friends, in such situations, and perambulate the place in silence. You can thus worship or not worship, precisely as the gods bid you, and are at least under no obligation to do hypocrisies, if you cannot conveniently worship. The fact is, though men are not in the least aware of it, the fine arts, divorced entirely from truth this long while, and wedded almost professedly to falsehood, fiction and such like, are got into what we must call an insane condition, they walk abroad without keepers, nobody suspecting their sad state, and do fantastic tricks equal to any in bedlam, especially when admitted to work regardless of expense, as we sometimes see them. What earnest soul passes that new St. Stephen's, and its wilderness of stone pepper boxes with their tin flags atop, worth two millions I am told, without mentally exclaiming apage, and cutting some pious cross in the air. If that be ideal beauty, except for sugar work, and the more elaborate kinds of gingerbread, what is real ugliness? To say merely, with an architectonic trumpet blast that cost two millions, good Christians, you observe well I am regardless of expense, and also of veracity, in every form. Too truly these poor fine arts have fallen mad. The fine arts once divorcing themselves from truth, are quite certain to fall mad if they do not die, and get flown away with by the devil, which latter is only the second worst result for us. Truth, fact, is the life of all things, falsity, fiction or whatever it may call itself, is certain to be death, and is already insanity, to whatever thing takes up with it. Fiction, even to the fine arts, is not a quite permissible thing. Sparingly permissible, within iron limits, or if you will reckon strictly, not permissible at all. The fine arts too, like the course and every art of man's God-given faculty, are to understand that they are sent hither not to fib and dance, but to speak and work, and, on the whole, that God Almighty's facts, such as given us, are the one pabulum which will yield them any nourishment in this world. Heavens, had they always well remembered that, what a world were it now! This seems strange doctrine, but it is to me, this long while, too sorrowfully certain, and I invite all my artist friends, of the painting, sculpturing, speaking, writing, especially of the singing and rhyming department, to meditate upon it, till, with amazement, remorse, and determination to amend, they get to see what lies in it. Homer's Iliad, if you examine, is no fiction but a ballad history, the heart of it burning with enthusiastic ill-informed belief. It sings itself, 
because its rude heart, wrapped into transcendency of zeal and admiration, is too full for speaking. The valor of Tydides, wrath of the divine Achilles, in old Greece, in Thyatis and Aeolia, to earnest souls that could believe them, these things were likely to be interesting. Human speech was once wholly true, as transcendent human speech still is. The Hebrew Bible, is it not, before all things, true, as no other book ever was or will be. All great poems, all great books, if you search the first foundation of their greatness, have been veridical, the truest they could get to be. Never will there be a great poem more that is not veridical, that does not ground itself on the interpreting of fact, to the rigorous exclusion of all falsity, fiction, idle dross of every kind, never can a poem truly interest human souls, except by, in the first place, taking with it the belief of said souls. Their belief, that is the whole basis, essence, and practical outcome, of human souls, leave that behind you, as poets everywhere have for a long time done, what is there left the poets in you? The early nations of the world, all nations so long as they continued simple and in earnest, knew without teaching that their history was an epic in Bible, the clouded struggling image of a God's presence, the action of heroes and God-inspired men. The noble intellect that could disenthrall such divine image, and present it to them clear, unclouded, invisible coherency comprehensible to human thought, was felt to be a Vates and the chief of intellects. No need to bid him sing it, make a poem of it. Nature herself compelled him, except in song or in psalm, such an insight by human eyes into the divine was not utterable. These are the Bibles of nations, to each its believed history is its Bible, not in Judea alone, or Hellas and Latium alone, but in all lands and all times. Nor, deeply as the fact is now forgotten, has it essentially in the smallest degree ceased to be the fact, nor will it cease. With every nation it is so, and with every man, for every nation, I suppose, was made by God, and every man too? Only there are some nations, like some men, who know it, and some who do not. The great nations are they that have known it well, the small and contemptible, both of men and nations, are they that have either never known it, or soon forgotten it and never laid it to heart. Of these comes nothing. The measure of a nation's greatness, of its worth under the sky to God and to men, is not the quantity of cotton it can spin, the quantity of bullion it has realized, but the quantity of heroisms it has achieved, of noble pieties and valiant wisdoms that were in it, that still are in it. Beyond doubt the Almighty Maker made this England too, and has been and forever is miraculously present here. The more is the pity for us if our eyes are grown owlish, and cannot see this fact of facts when it is before us. Once it was known that the highest did of a surety dwell in this nation, divinely avenging, and divinely saving and rewarding, leading, by steep and flaming paths, by heroisms, pieties and noble acts and thoughts, this nation heavenward, if it would and dared. Known or not, this, or else the terrible inverse of this, is forevermore the fact. The history of England too, had the fine or other arts taught us to read it right, is the record of the divine appearances among us, of the brightnesses out of heaven that have irradiated our terrestrial struggle, and spanned our wild deluges, and weltering seas of trouble, as with celestial rainbows, and symbols of eternal covenants. It is the Bible of the nation, what part of it they have laid to heart, and do practically know for truth, is the available Bible they have. Ask yourselves, what are the eternal covenants which you can believe, and dare not for your life's sake but go and observe? These are your Bible, your God's word such as it may be, these you will continually struggle to obey, other than these, not continually, or authentically at all. Did the Maker of this universe reveal Himself, to your believing intellect, in script mainly, in cotton trades, and profitable industries and gamblings? Here too you will see miracles, tubular bridges, beta percha telegraphs, not to speak of sudden Hudson cornucopias, script mana showers, and pillar of cloud for all the flunkies, miracles after a sort. Your Bible will be a political economy, your psalmist and evangelist will be McCrowdy, your practical worship the insatiable desire, and continual sacred effort, to make money. Bible, of one or the other sort, Bible, evangelist, and worship you infallibly will have, and some are God worships, fruitful in human heroisms, in blessed arts, and deeds long memorable, shining with a sacred splendor of the Empyrean across all earthly darknesses and contradictions, and some again are, to a terrible extent. Devil worships, fruitful in temporary bullion, in upholstery, gluttony and universal varnish and gold leaf, and issuing, alas, at length in street barricades, and a confused return of them to the devil whose they are, my friend, I have to speak in crude language, the wretched times being dumb and deaf, and if thou find no truth under this but the phantom of an extinct Hebrew one, I at present cannot help it. Hengst invasions, Norman conquests, battles of Brunanburg, battles of Evesham, Towton, Plantagenets, wars of roses, 
Wars of Roundheads, does the fool in his heart believe that all this was a Donnybrook bedlam, originating nowhere, proceeding nowhither? His beautifully cultivated intellect has given him such interpretation, and no better, of the universe we live in? He discerns it to be an enormous city weaving shop, and turbid manufactory of eatables and drinkables and wearables, sparingly supplied with provender by the industrious individuals, and much infested by the mad and idle. And he can consent to live here, he does not continually think of suicide as a remedy? The unhappy mortal, if a soul ever awaken in him again, his first thought will be of prussic acid, I should say. All history, whether McCrowdy and his fine arts know the fact or not, is an inarticulate Bible, and in a dim intricate manner reveals the divine appearances in this lower world. For God did make this world, and does forever govern it, the loud roaring loom of time, with all its French revolutions, Jewish revelations, weaves the vesture thou seest him by. There is no biography of a man, much less any history, or biography of a nation, but wraps in it a message out of heaven, addressed to the hearing ear or to the not hearing. What this universe is, what the laws of God are, the life of every man will a little teach it you, the life of all men and of all things, only this could wholly teach it you, and you are to be open to learn. Who are they, gifted from above, that will convert voluminous dryest dust into an epic and even a Bible? Who will smelt, in the all-victorious fire of his soul, these scandalous bewildering rubbish mountains of sleepy dryest dust, till they give up the golden ingot that lies imprisoned in them? The veritable revelation, this, of the ways of God to England, how the Almighty Power, and His mysterious providences, dealt heretofore with England, more and more what the Almighty's judgments with us, His chastisements and His beneficences, were, what the Supreme Will, since ushering this English people on the stage of things, has guided them to do and to become. Fine arts, literatures, poetries? If they are human arts at all, where have they been wool-gathering, these centuries long, wandering literally like creatures fallen mad? It awakens graver thoughts than were in Marlborough, that saying of his, that he knew no English history but what he had learned from Shakespeare. In Shakespeare's grand intelligence the history of England, cursory as was his study of it, does model itself, for the first time, into something of rhythmic and poetic, there are scattered traits and tones of a national epos in those historical plays of his. In Shakespeare, more than in another, lay that high Vate's talent of interpreting confused human actualities, and unfolding what divine melodious ideals, or thoughts of the supreme, were embodied in them, he, more than any other, might have done somewhat towards making history a Bible. But, alas, it was not in the temple of the nations, with all intelligence ministering to him and cooperating with him, that his workshop was laid, it was in the Bankside Playhouse that Shakespeare was set to work, and the sovereign populace had wear for their sixpence from him there. After all, I do not blame the poor fine arts for taking into fiction, and into all the deeper kinds of falsity which grow from that. Ignatius, and a world too ready to follow him, had discovered the divine virtues of fiction in far higher provinces, the road to fiction lay wide open for all things. But nature's eternal voice, inaudible at present or faintly audible, proclaims the contrary nevertheless, and will make it known again one day. Fiction, I think, or idle falsity of any kind, was never tolerable, except in a world which did itself abound in practical lies and solemn shams, and which had gradually impressed on its inhabitants the inane form of character tolerant of that kind of wear. A serious soul, can it wish, even in hours of relaxation, that you should fiddle empty nonsense to it? A serious soul would desire to be entertained, either with absolute silence, or with what was truth, and had fruit in it, and was made by the maker of us all. With the idle soul I can fancy it far otherwise, but only with the idle. Given an idle potentate, monster of opulence, gluttonous bloated nawab, of black color or of white, naturally he will have prating storytellers to amuse his half-sleepy hours of rumination, if from his deep gross stomach, sinking overloaded as if towards its last torpor, they can elicit any transient glow of interest, tragic or comic, especially any wrinkle of momentary laughter, however idle, great shall be their reward. Wits, storytellers, ballad singers, especially dancing girls who understand their trade, are in much request with such gluttonous half-sleeping, black or white monster of opulence, a bevy of supple dancing girls who with the due mixture, mixture settled by custom, and with not more than the due mixture, of lascivious fire, will represent to him, brandishing their daggers, and rhythmically chanting and posturing, the loves of Vishnu, loves of Adonis, death of Psyche, barber of Seville, or whatever nonsense there may be, according to time or country, these are the kind of artists fit for such unfortunate stuff stupefied Nawab, in his hours of rumination, upon these his hot heavy laden I may rest without abhorrence, if with perceptible momentary satisfaction emerging from his bottomless ennui, then victory and gold purses to the artist, be such artists crowned with laurel or with parsley, 
and declare divine in presence of all men. Luxurious Europe, in its reading publics, dilettanti, cognoscenti and other publics, is wholly one big ugly nawab of that kind, who has converted all the fine arts into after-dinner amusements, slave adjuncts to his cookeries, upholsteries, tailories, and other palpably coarse arts. The brutish monster has turned all the nine muses, who by birth are sacred priestesses of heaven, into scandalous by air, and they dance with supple motions, to enlighten the vile darkness of his ennui for him. Too truly mad, these poor fine arts. The coarse arts too, if he had not an authentic stomach and skin, which always bring him a little right again in those departments, would go mad. How all things hang together. Universal Jesuitism having once lodged itself in the heart, you will see it in the very fingernails by and by. Calculate how far it is from Sophocles and Aeschylus to Knowles and Scribe, how Homer has gradually changed into Sir Harris Nicholas, or what roads the human species must have traveled before a psalm of David could become an opera at the Haymarket, and men, with their divine gift of music, instead of solemnly celebrating the highest fact, or singing to the praise of God, consented to celebrate the lowest nonsense, and sing to the praise of Jenny Lind and the Gazaladra, perhaps the step from Oliver Cromwell to Lord John Russell will not seem so unconscionable. I find it within, and not without, the order of nature, and that all things, like all men, are blood relations to one another. This accursed nightmare, which we name Jesuitism, will have to vanish, our comfort is, that life itself is not much longer possible otherwise. But I say, have you computed what a distance forwards it may be towards some new psalm of David done with our new appliances, and much improved wind instruments, grammatical and other? That is the distance of the new golden age, my friend, not less than that, I lament to say. And the centuries that intervene are a foul agonistic welter through the Stygian seas of mud, a long scavenger age, inevitable where the mother of abominations has long dwelt. It is to be hoped one is not blind with all to the celebrated virtues that are in Jesuitism, to its missionary zeal, its contempt of danger, its scientific, heroic and other prowesses, of which there is such celebrating. I do not doubt that there are virtues in it, that we and it, along with this immeasurable sea of miseries which it has brought upon us, shall ultimately get the benefit of its virtues too. Peruvian bark, of use in human agues, tidings from the fabulous East by Durbalot, Du Halda, and others, examples of what human energy and faculty are equal to, even under the inspiration of Ignatius, nothing of this small residue of pearls from such a continent of putrid shellfish, shall be lost to the world. Nay, I see, across this black deluge of consecrated falsity, the world ripening towards glorious new developments, unimagined hitherto, of which this abominable mud deluge itself, threatening to submerge us all, was the inevitable precursor, and the means decreed by the Eternal. If it please heaven, we shall all yet make our exodus from Houndsditch, and bid the sordid continents, of once rich apparel now grown poisonous Uclo, a mild farewell. Exodus into wider horizons, into God's daylight once more, where eternal skies, measuring more than three L's, shall again overarch us, and men, immeasurably richer for having dwelt among the Hebrews, shall pursue their human pilgrimage, Saint Ignatius and much other saintship, and superstitious terror and lumber, lying safe behind us, like the nightmares of a sleep that is past. I said the virtue of obedience was not to be found except among the Jesuits, how, in fact, among the anti-Jesuits, still in a revolutionary posture in this world, can you expect it? Sanskulatism is a rebel, has its birth, and being, in open mutiny, and cannot give you examples of obedience. It is so with several other virtues and cardinal virtues, they seem to have vanished from the world, and I often say to myself, Jesuitism and other superstitious scandals cannot go, till we have read and appropriated from them the tradition of these lost noblenesses, and once more under the new conditions made them ours. Jesuitism, the papa with his three hats, and whole continents of chimerical lumber will then go, their errand being wholly done. We cannot make our exodus from Houndsditch till we have got our own along with us. The Jew old clothes having now grown fairly pestilential, a poisonous encumbrance in the path of men, burn them up with revolutionary fire, as you like and can, even so, but you shall not quit the place till you have gathered from their ashes what of gold or other enduring metal was sewed upon them, or woven in the tissue of them. That is the appointed course of human things. Here are two excerpts from the celebrated Gathercoal, a Yankee friend of mine, which flash strangely a kind of torch gleam into the hidden depths, and indicate to us the grave and womb of Jesuitism, and of several other things. Moses and the Jews did not make God's laws, exclaims he, no, by no means, they did not even read them in a way that has been final, or is satisfactory to me. In several important respects I find said reading decidedly bad, and will not, in any wise, think of adopting it. How dare I, thank you. And yet, alas, if we forget to read these laws at all, 
if we go along as if they were not there. My enlightened friends of this present supreme age, what shall I say to you? That time does rest on eternity, that he who has no vision of eternity will never get a true hold of time, or its affairs. Time is so constructed, that is the fact of the construction of this world. And no class of mortals who have not, through Nazareth or otherwise, come to get heartily acquainted with such fact, perpetually familiar with it in all the outs and ins of their existence, have ever found this universe habitable long. Alas, no, their fraternities, the qualities, free trade philosophies, greatest happiness principles, soon came to a conclusion, and the poor creatures had to go, to the devil, I fear. Generations such as ours play a curious part in world history. They sit as apes do round a fire in the woods, but know not how to feed it with fresh sticks. They have to quit it soon, and march, into chaos, as I conjecture, into that land of which Bedlam is the Mount Zion. The world turns out not to be made of mere eatables and drinkables, of newspaper puffs, gilt carriages, conspicuous flunkies, no, but of something other than these. Old Suetonius Romans, corrupt babbling Greeks of the lower empire, examples more than one, consider them, be taught by them, add not to the number of them. Heroism, not the apery and traditions of heroism, the feeling, spoken or silent, that in man's life there did lie a godlike, and at his time history was verily but an emblem of some eternal, without this there had been no Rome either, it was this that had made old Rome, old Greece, and old Judea. Apes, with their wretched blinking eyes, squatted round a fire which they cannot feed with new wood, which they say will last forever without new wood, or, alas, which they say is going out forever, it is a sad sight. Elsewhere my eccentric friend, as some call him, whose center, however, I think I have got into, has this passage. Church, do you say? Look eighteen hundred years ago, in the stable at Bethlehem, an infant laid in a manger. Look, thou ass, and behold it, it is a fact, the most indubitable of facts, thou wilt thereby learn innumerable things. Jesus of Nazareth and the life he led, and the death he died, does it teach thee nothing? Through this, as through a miraculous window, the heaven of martyr heroism, the divine depths of sorrow, of noble labor, and the unspeakable silent expanses of eternity, first in man's history disclose themselves. The admiration of all nobleness, divine worship of godlike nobleness, how universal it is in the history of man. But mankind, that singular entity mankind, is like the fertilest, fluidest, most wondrous element, an element in which the strangest things crystallize themselves, and spread out in the most astounding growths. The event at Bethlehem was of the year one, but all years since that, 1800 of them now, have been contributing new growth to it, and see, there it stands, the church. Touching the earth with one small point, springing out of one small seed grain, rising out therefrom, ever higher, ever broader, high as the heaven itself, broad till it overshadow the whole visible heaven and earth, and no star can be seen but through it. From such a seed grain so has it grown, planted in the reverences and sacred opulences of the soul of mankind, fed continually by all the noblenesses of some forty generations of men the world tree of the nations for so long. Alas, if its roots are now dead, and it have lost hold of the firm earth, or clear belief of mankind, what, great as it is, can by possibility become of it? Shaken to and fro, in Jesuitisms, quorum controversies, and the storms of inevitable fate, it must sway hither and thither, not ever farther from the perpendicular, not at last too far, and, sweeping the eternal heavens clear of its old brown foliage and multitudinous rooks' nests, come to the ground with much confused crashing, and disclose the diurnal and nocturnal upper lights again. The dead world tree will have declared itself dead. It will lie there an imbruglio of torn boughs and ruined fragments, of bewildered splittings and widespread shivers, out of which the poor inhabitants must make what they can. Enough now of gather coal and his torch gleams. Simple souls still clamor occasionally for what they call a new religion. My friends, you will not get this new religion of yours, I perceive, you already have it, have always had it all that is true is your religion, is it not? Commanded by the eternal God to be performed, I should think, if it is true. Do you not already, in your dim heads, know truths by the thousand, and yet, in your dead hearts, will you perform them by the ten, by the unit? New religion one last word with you on this rather contemptible subject. You say, the old ages had a noble belief about the world, and therefore were capable of a noble activity in the world. My friends, it is partly true, your skepticism and Jesuitism, your ignoble no belief, except what belief a beaver or judicious pig were capable of, is too undeniable, observe, however, that in this your fatal misery, there is action and reaction, and do not confound the one with the other. Put the thing in its right posture, cart not before horse, if you would make an effort to stir from this fatal spot. 
it is your own falsity that makes the universe incredible. I affirm to you, this universe, in all times, and in your own poor time as well, is the express image and direct counterpart of the human souls, and their thoughts and activities, who dwell there. It is a true adage, as the fool thinks, the bell clinks. This mad universe, says Navalis, is the waste picture of your own dream. Be noble of mind, all nature gives response to your heroic struggle for recognition by her, with her awful eternal voices answers to every mind, yea, I am divine, be thou. From the cloud whirlwind speaks a god yet, my friend, to every man who has a human soul. To the inhuman brute soul, indeed, she answers, yea, I am brutal, a big cattle stall, rag fair and St. Catherine's wharf, enter thou, and fat vittle, if thou be faithful, shall not fail. Not because heaven existed, did men know good from evil, but because, I invite you to consider, lay quite the other way. It was because men, having hearts as well as stomachs, felt there and knew through all their being, the difference between good and evil, that heaven and hell first came to exist. That is the sequence, that and not the contrary. If you have now no heaven to look to, if you now sprawl, lamed and lost, sunk to the chin in the pathless sloughs of this lower world without guidance from above, know that the fault is not heaven's at all, but your own. Our poor friends the apes by the Dead Sea have now no heaven either, they look into this universe now, and find it tragically grown to be the humbug they insisted on its being. Moses went his ways, and this enchantment fell upon them. Such enchantments Radamanthine nature does yet daily execute on the rebellious, he that has eyes may still daily see them, fearful and wonderful ever as of old. How can you believe in a heaven, the like of you? What struggle in your mean existence ever pointed thitherward? None. The first heroic soul sent down into this world, he, looking up into the sea of stars, around into the moaning forests and big oceans, into life and death, love and hate, and joy and sorrow, and the illimitable loud thundering loom of time, was struck dumb by it, as the thought of every earnest soul still is, and fell on his face, and with his heart cried for salvation in the world whirlpool. To him the open secret of this universe was no longer quite a secret, but he had caught a glimpse of it, much hidden from the like of us in these times, do nobly, thou shalt resemble the maker of all this, do ignobly, the enemy of the maker. This is the divine sense of right and wrong in man, true reading of his position in this universe forevermore the indisputable God's message still legible in every created heart, though speedily erased and painted over, under articles, and cants and empty ceremonials, in so many hearts, making the open secret a very shut one indeed. My friends, across these fogs of murky twaddle and philanthropism, in spite of sad decadent world trees slash with their rookeries of foul creatures, the silent stars, and all the eternal luminaries of the world, shine even now to him that has an eye. In this day as in all days, around and in every man, are voices from the gods, imperative to all, if obeyed by even none, which say audibly, Arise, thou son of Adam, son of time, make this thing more divine, and that thing, and thyself, of all things, and work, and sleep not, for the night cometh, wherein no man can work one he that has an ear may still hear. Surely, surely this ignoble sluggishness, skeptical torpor, indifference to all that does not bear on mammon and his interests is not the natural state of human creatures, and is not doomed to be their final one. Other states once were, or there had never been a society, or any noble thing, among us at all. Under this brutal stagnancy there lies painfully imprisoned some tendency which could become heroic. The restless gnawing on we which, like a dark dim ocean flood, communicating with the flathons and stygian deeps, begirdles every human life so guided, is it not the painful cry even of that imprisoned heroism? Imprisoned it will never rest, set forth at present, on these sad terms, it cannot be. You unfortunates, what is the use of your money bags, of your territories, funded properties, your mountains of possessions, equipments and mechanic inventions, which the flunky pauses over, awestruck, and almost rises into epos and prophecy at sight of? No use, or less than none. Your skin is covered, and your digestive and other bodily apparatus is supplied, and you have but to wish in these respects, and more is ready, and, the devils, I think, are quizzing you. You ask for happiness, oh give me happiness, and they hand you ever new varieties of covering for the skin, ever new kinds of supply for the digestive apparatus, new and ever new, worse or not a whit better than the old, and, and, this is your happiness question mark as if you were sick children, as if you were not men, but a kind of apes. I rather say, be thankful for your ennui, it is your last mark of manhood, this at least is a perpetual admonition, and true sermon preached to you. From the chair of verity this, whatever chairs be chairs of cantity. Happiness is not come, nor like to come, Ennui, with its great waste ocean voice, moans answer, never, never. That ocean voice, I tell you, is a great fact, 
it comes from Phlegathon and the gates of the abyss, its bodeful never-resting inexorable moan is the voice of primeval fate, and of the eternal necessity of things. Will you shake away your nightmare and arise, or must you lie writhing under it, till death relieve you? Unfortunate creatures. You are fed, clothed, lodged as men never were before, every day a new variety of magnificence are you equipped and attended to, such wealth of material means as is now yours was never dreamed of by man before, and to do any noble thing, with all this mountain of implements, is forever denied you. Only ignoble, expensive and unfruitful things can you now do, nobleness has vanished from the sphere where you live. The way of it is lost, lost, the possibility of it has become incredible. We must try to do without it, I am told. Well, rejoice in your upholsteries and cookeries, then, if so be they will make you happy. Let the varieties of them be continual and innumerable. In all things let perpetual change, if that is a perpetual blessing to you, be your portion instead of mine, incur that prophet's curse, and in all things in this sublunary world make yourselves like unto a wheel. Mount into your railways, whirl from place to place, at the rate of fifty, or if you like of five hundred miles an hour, you cannot escape from that inexorable all-encircling ocean moan of ennui. No, if you would mount to the stars, and do yacht voyages under the belts of Jupiter, or stock deer on the ring of Saturn, it would still begirdle you. You cannot escape from it, you can but change your place in it, without solacement except one moment's. That prophetic sermon from the deeps will continue with you, till you wisely interpret it and do it, or else till the crack of doom swallow it and you. Adieu, au revoir.